Welcome to the 2013 Regional Chris Craft Commander Club Rendezvous. That's a mouthful to say. Our guest speaker today is Lee Galen, and he is an exceptional individual. And most of you know him. Those of you that don't, I'd like to share this little story of when I bought this boat, right? Shelly and I decide we're going to buy a boat, right? So we start traveling around looking for it. We find this boat. The story. We've got to find it. We've got to buy it. So I'm sitting there and I'm trying to get this one engine to suck water. And I'm totally freaking out, right? To spend all this money on this boat and it won't draw water. I've tried everything that I can think of, right? And so, all right, Chris Craft Commander Club. That's why one of the reasons that we went to the commander is like the resources have got to be there, right? So I made a post. I did not put my phone number on, but I did put my phone number in my, my profile. Out of the blue, my cell phone rings. It's Lee Dale, and he calls me. And he says, da da da, -da introduced himself and walked me through all the, the, the basic steps that we need, I needed to do. What did you do? How did you do that? And basically over the phone, out of the blue, he just called up and helped me troubleshoot my boat. And since then, you know, we've kind of been developing a little bit more of a friendship as much as you can from someone that lives seven, eight hundred miles away. But uh, that's the kind of individual that he's here. He's, he's been around these boats a very long time. I would consider him an expert in um, what he does. And I believe he even has the wherewithal if he doesn't know exactly, he's just not going to dig in. He's going to do his research first because it's mostly diagnostics, as he says, and then very little actual work, because you need to solve the root problem and not just fix it. So anyway, Mr. Mr. Lee is going to take the floor now and uh, may teach us some, some more stuff. Brian's right in, in the aspect that, in my opinion, 90% of the work on, on any repair is diagnostic. It only takes a few minutes to actually fix something. It takes longer to find out why it broke. Um, a lot of people will have a, an overheating situation. They'll put an impeller in. They'll go out. A week later, that impeller is gone and it's overheating again. They fixed the symptom, but they didn't find the cause. And you'll find that in a lot of different scenarios, not just in overheating, but in electrical um, engines. What I'm going to do today is I'll, I'll share war stories with you today, and I'm going to share things that will empower you with knowledge because it is knowledge that will not necessarily help you go down here and tear your boat apart and fix it. But in most cases, it will help you know um, when the person who may be working on your boat is giving you a straight story and when he's trying to jostle his way through something to get a paycheck. That happens all the time. So first of all, what I want to do is go through a few tools. Uh, if you don't have these aboard your boat, I'm going to show you in my toolbox the two most important tools that I have on board for electrical. The first one is, tw is a simple 12 volt test light. How many have one? Okay, if you don't have one, get one. It's nothing more than an alligator clip, a light bulb, and a probe. What can this little light, what can this test? It can test anything from a switch that's gone bad or not. To a fuse, to a glass fuse. Now, the other thing I use is a good digital voltmeter. I use Fluke. You can use whichever one you want to. The only thing I recommend is you get one that's digital because the sweeping needle has to be calibrated. The digital is not. The digital is self-calibrated. Now. I not only use this to measure voltage, but more times than more times than not, I use this to measure what? Resistance. Resistance. Say it loud. Resistance. Resistance and continuity. 
this is this is probably my best continuity tester right here and the reason is my fluke comes with an adapter that screws on the end that has alligator clips and I'll clip another piece of wire onto it and I can make it as long as I need to make it I can test something from the engine room all the way up to the bridge and it has a beeper on it if you set it up and you turn on the beeper doesn't matter where I am on the boat if I've got continuity I know it if it doesn't beep the circuits not closed that's also a diode checker but I use it more or less for continuity so that I can hear when I need to, when I need to hear so it measures voltage measures resistance measures continuity those are the three things I use these two tools right here if you buy the good stuff if you buy fluke and you buy a decent test light you're probably looking 150 bucks for the uh, average Radio Shack, Walmart, uh, Harbor Freight, Home Depot, the little small meter, you'll spend a lot less and it'll work just as good. I just prefer the Fluke because it's a little bit tougher and in, in my line of work, I, this thing gets thrown more than once a week, I'm sure. So, test light, first of all, when we're testing fuses, you got two types of fuses in most cases. You've got the new flat style, you've got the glass fuses. Most of the time you pull a glass fuse, you look, you're looking at the element in the middle, and either the element at my age is so thin I can't hardly see it anymore, or in this case, the, the blue is not clear. You can't really see the element that's in it. So on the glass fuse, all you're going to simply do is set up your ohm meter and set it up on ohms. Once you do that, you touch one to one end, touch one to the other, read your meter. If it goes down to zero, your circuit's good. If you want to just do it by sound, you hit the buzzer. I know the fuse is good. Now. Why is that important? Because I have seen glass fuses that don't burn out in the middle. I've seen glass fuses where the filament will detach up at the end where the metal is. So when you pull a fuse to check it, don't just look in the middle. It takes you an extra three seconds to run the test. Check each end of the fuse and know for sure that it's good. Otherwise, you'll chase your tail for three hours and come back and figure out it was the fuse all along. How many people know how to check these fuses when you can't see the filament? It's real simple. On the end, there's two probe contacts. All you have to do is take your test light with the fuse in, touch right in the end there on each end. It should light up on both sides. If it lights up on both sides, the fuse is good. If it lights up on one side, the fuse is bad. You can do the same thing with your own meter. Touch one side there, touch one side there. If you got nothing, it's no good. And that one's good. Easiest way to test fuses. I'm gonna go ahead and pass this one around and let you look at it so you can see the probes on the inside. And there's the blast fuse. Y'all know what those look like, I'm sure. Every time you have a switch that goes bad on your boat, how many of you actually just toss it and get a new one? I do it. Who else? Just toss it and get a new one, right? If you actually had a little bit of time to fool with them and save yourself a little bit of money, you will find that there is very little in these switches that go bad. So I went to the parts house here a little while ago and I picked up just an average, just an average brass toggle switch. Nothing fancy. But I did it so I could take it apart and show it to you. All these switches that are on your boat, the push-pull switches, they come apart the same way. There's four little ears on the bottom of them and all you have to do is take a small screwdriver and gently peel it up. Be careful, some of them are spring-loaded. 
peel it up, take it apart. Inside, you're going to find two copper contacts. And that's, that's pretty much all there is inside all those switches. When you pull it, you're closing the two contacts together. So if you pull a switch on and nothing happens, chances are the only thing that's wrong is either this little sweeper plate right here is corroded and dirty, or these two contacts are corroded and dirty. And with about 15, 20 minutes worth of your time, a little bit of sandpaper, a little bit of alcohol, uh, clean it up, put it back together. And the reason I say this is because I don't know how many of you know it, but the push-pull switches on our commanders, you can get those push-pulls from Cole Hersey. The problem is the threads that are on the end where the toggle head screws on are a different thread from standard. So you may get a switch that fits the hole, you may get a switch that fits the bill, but when you go to put your little hourglass piece on the end of it, that didn't sound good. Uh, but <laughs> when you go to put the little hourglass piece on the end, it may not thread up. And the reason is, is they use a special, they use some, some type of a special thread, and I've run into that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass this around. One thing to be careful of, the actual toggle here, what it does is it sits in there that's just a plastic piece. There's nothing electrical to go bad on it, but it has a spring in it. So that spring, you push on this little plate, and when it pushes on that little plate, it just pushes it back and forth across these two copper contacts. There has been very, 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 very few toggle switches on our beloved commanders that I couldn't fix. And it's just because you have to take a little bit of time and say, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna see what makes this thing tick. And once you take it apart, look at how simple it is, you put it right back together again and it'll work. And it'll continue to work. So let me, let me give that to you. And you can look through it and pass it all around. Now, how do we test a switch? We test the switch the same, thing, the same way we test everything else. We're either going to use an ohmmeter or we're going to use a test light. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned about the ohmmeter yet. If you're using a test light, you're going to use it with the switch hooked up. The reason being, you need a power source for the test light to work. So, every switch for instance, I got a push button horn switch here, which can also be called a push button start switch. It can also be called a push button stop switch on a diesel. Um, what else? Let's see, horn, start, stop. Oh, fuel pump primer switch. I've seen that on a 38 with electric fuel pumps. Push it in to prime the fuel pump. It's just a simple open and close switch. It's just like that switch I just passed around. It's just built differently. So what you have, if it's off the boat and it's not wired up, we're gonna use the ohm meter. The reason we're gonna use the ohm meter is we're gonna test continuity. If it was wired up, the way it would be wired up, one side would be hot all the time. One side is only hot once the plunger's pushed in. And it works exactly the same way that other switch I just passed around does. You're just merely moving a sweeper back and forth over a set of contacts. So considering this one's off the boat, if I wanted to test the switch and I thought the switch had a good chance of being bad, I'm gonna hook up my own meter first. I'm gonna turn on the beeper. And then all I'm gonna do is go across both contacts. And I've got nothing. Now when I push the button in, we know the switch is good. Nothing wrong with it. Now if it becomes intermittent, it's time to take it apart clean it. Any questions? Switches are the easiest things to work with. 
but yet we're very quick to just pull them off and toss them and throw them away, but there's really nothing to go bad on. It's just corrosion and dirt in most cases. Test light, again, you find the ground. One side should be hot all the time. The other side should only be hot when you push the button in. Or, in the case of the toggle switch, when you pull it out. Any questions? Okay, let's talk about wire for a minute. When I work on these boats, as I know when you probably bought yours, the, the various array of wires we find. Um, there's actually a picture on my website that shows me holding the biggest bundle of wire, and it's nothing but a big nest. And, and the picture is in caption, 40 years of previous owners. That bundle of wire that I'm holding in that picture was taken out of uh, Byron and Mimi's 42 down in Florida. Byron and I spent about three hours one day just doing nothing but hunting wires that had no purpose. And after 40 years, that's a hunt. I mean, you literally, you just grab one wire, trace it. Grab one wire and trace it. It takes two, three people to do it at all times, but if you find one that's not going anywhere, get it out of there because it's just going to cause you more diagnostic time the next time you need to fix something. Every wire needs to have a purpose. Every boat needs to have a wiring diagram of some sort. The wiring diagrams for all of the larger boats up to 42 feet I know are on the Commander Club site. The diagrams from the factory are actually there. Um, and a couple of the clients that I deal with have actually taken that diagram and taken it to a commercial printer and had it blown up into a full-size blueprint. And I love working on that boat. <laughs> I love working on that boat because we'll take that diagram, we'll lay it out on the table, and any time we make a change to that boat, it goes in that diagram you will find that if you will just spend time diagramming your boat, getting rid of the wires that have no purpose, getting rid of the wires that are either burnt, melted, or need to be replaced, you will find that after a fair amount of time, and I would say a year or two, you will find that working on your boat's electrical system will become just second nature. And the reason is, is you know where everything is. If this switch doesn't work, you already know in the back of your mind, it goes to this bus bar, it goes to this fuse, it terminates over here on this servo unit. So it's either here, here, or here, instead of opening up the cabinet and going, oh my God. Now, wire. I can't stress this enough, but there is a code in marine wiring. The ABYC has its code. I have some simple, I have some simple rules that follow the ABYC code. First off, marine grade wire only. Now, it doesn't have to be in a jacket like this. I use it in a jacket like this because it makes diagramming the boat easier. You can, take a, you can take a run of wire like this. If I was to put in a bilge pump, or I was to put in a blower, or I was to put in a stereo, I take a black Sharpie marker, and every so many feet, I'll actually label that white jacket. If I don't want to label it with a Sharpie, I have what's called a zebra printer label maker. Everybody knows what that is, right? It's the one that spits out the white tape the really nice letters on it, you can take a zebra printer and just put 12 volt forward bilge pump or just forward bilge pump, wrap it around and type it ever so many feet so that when you're looking at that big harness, when you're looking at that big harness, you can pull this wire out and you go to the next tab and you go, mm, yeah, I remember putting that one in. Diagramming and labeling. Yep, Here's, here is the original diagram for the 38 to 42 foot boat for the electrical, the 12 volt electrical. 
Now, what what I was saying was what one of my clients did. Everybody, a lot of people in here know Fred and Eileen, so it's Fred that I'm talking about. Fred took this diagram down to a commercial printer, and when the commercial printer finished, he had a diagram that was bigger than this whiteboard. And and then he just updates it as we go along. So this is available on the Commander Club site. It's free. It's in our library section. It's also in the Super Disc. If you don't have the Super Disc, let me highly encourage you to get the Super Disc. Why? Not because it's something we sell, but because it's something that's full of a lot of technical drawings, technical literature, not to mention all of the archived articles that mean something. Not just the, hey, we went out on our boat this weekend and we had a good time and it was good weather. Char and Dick Moreland, and I don't know if they've got anybody else working with them or not these days, but Char and Dick have done this for years. I did my hand at it a year, and that was all. I, I don't know. You couldn't pay me enough. But Char and Dick every day sit down and go through every post from the day before that comes up across our forum. If it has valid information, if it has an updated link, if it has a good part number, if it is a verified method or a verified diagnostic or uh, even if it's just a war story like uh, what I repeatedly say this this story came from the y'all ain't gonna believe this department if it's one of those it'll be in the super disk it'll be in the next version um, Char what formats are we available now on the super disk we've got uh, DVD and USB is running, since so many people have updated um, laptops and things, USB is outselling the DVDs by a lot. Oh, year. I can see that. Flash drive is the way to go. Mm -hmm. So, I highly encourage you. You know, I, I still see a post every month or so. Somebody will say, Does, can anybody tell me where to get an owner's manual for my boat? Yeah, get the super disc. It's better than any owner's manual you're going to find because you're dealing with stories, issues, and things that 1,200 other people have already dealt with. And it's completely searchable. So if you haven't ever seen it, it's completely searchable. You can go in the top and you could, ty you could type in 427 water pump, or you could type in small block Chevrolet carburetor, or you could type in marine alternator. And it will come back with every posted article that's in the super disk in a list form. You simply click on the link, it takes you straight to the article. You can read the article. We post, we post links as to where you can find certain parts. We post part numbers. Um, right now we're dealing with one, and I think it was just resolved, but I'm not positive. But I will tell you, one of the, one, one of the ways we go into detail is how many people in here have crab caps on their small block Chevrolets? Used to. So, so, so the people that have them now know that there are two different crab caps. One is what I call a tall one, and one is a short one. Well, there's one of them we can't find. And every time somebody comes back with a part number and says, hey, I found one, and we take the part number and we go source it, and we come back, there goes a 42 going out. Where's the scratch? They're coming in. They're coming in? That's it, on our last arrival. Nice. So, so that's, where, that's where you benefit from the super disc. I mean, the super disc just has so much information. And it's all archived information since this club started in 1999. So this is what, 2013. How many posts have we got in Super Disc now, Char? Uh, <coughs> Ballpark. Oh, it's. Of I was gonna say it's Almost way over thousand. Twenty thousand now. Yeah. So if you ever if you ever get to wondering where you, where you can find an owner's manual for your commander, that's where I'd start because that's where you're gonna find it. Any other questions so far? One one last thing on electrical, battery cables. By the way, I didn't finish. Marine cable. 
it actually says on the jacket that it's marine cable. What makes it marine cable, anybody? Stranded wire. And? Tim coated. And? Oil resistant. Oil resistant. 30 bucks a foot. <laughs> <laughs> That, that should have been the first answer. <laughs> okay, stranded wire, that's important. Household wire is always solid core. It's usually solid copper or in the older houses it's solid aluminum. We don't like that. On a marine application, it has to be stranded. The reason is, is the different connectors that we use, such as butt connect, what I call butt connectors or crimp connectors. Everybody's familiar with them, right? you're going to use crimp connectors or butt connectors, let me give you two pieces of information on it. First of all, never use a crimp connector or a butt connector where it's going to come, come in contact with water. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, this is what I call a butt connector. Now. I haven't seen that many of them, so I don't want to over-dramatize them, but I have seen enough boats sink from a butt connector that I don't want to see anymore. Um, and, and let me explain why. Nine times out of ten, bilge pump goes bad or a float switch goes bad. You run out on Saturday, you run to West Marine, you run to your boat store, you run to wherever you need to, you grab the float switch, you grab the bilge pump, you come back, it's a 10 minute fix, crimp the connectors in, hook the hose up, great, now we can go boating. And you never give it another thought. Except, this crimp connector on the inside is not stainless. In most cases it's aluminum, in some cases it's copper. But what that means is, if those wires drop down into water, what's going to happen? Corrode. Corrode. And what's going to happen after it corrodes long enough? It's, it's going to fail. And when's it going to fail? When you need it. When you need it. Now, when it's going to fail, is about 2 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday when you're not giving your boat a simple thought until somebody calls you on the phone and says, um, we have a problem. So, bilge pumps especially with crimp connectors. You can use the crimp connectors. I don't have a problem with that. However, I would implore you to take the time and solder the connections after you crimp them. Just run a little bit of solder down through them. Give yourself a good electrical connection that's not just crimped. The second thing is, is take a piece of heat shrink. Heat shrink tubing will slide right over the wire. You can get it for the size connector that you're using. You take the heat shrink and slide it down over the connector. Cigarette lighter or a propane torch or whatever you want to use. Heat source, heat gun, and it'll, it'll weather seal it. So then you're not just counting on the crimp connector. You've got solder holding the connection together and you've got heat shrink over top of it to weather seal it. Does it seem like a lot when it's Saturday afternoon you want to go boating? Yeah. But, you know, it's either that or Wednesday morning at 2 o'clock. Your choice. The, the final thing is wherever you do your electrical connections for your bilge pumps or anything else that's in the engine room, <coughs> mount them high enough to where water can contact and you won't have a problem. Most people twist the wires to get them throw them down in the building. That's it. They don't give it a thought. Any questions on that? Last piece of equipment I'm going to show you. This is my favorite piece of equipment because when I first bought it, I have to tell you, I groomed. This piece of equipment right here was almost 50 bucks. And it's just, all it is very simple piece of metal. But what it is, it's a crimp connector for battery cables. The reason I have crimp connectors for battery cables is because when I do battery cables in a boat, I custom make every one of them. 
The reason I custom make every one of them is because nine times out of ten, when I go down in an engine room, I find one that was bought at AutoZone, Advance, Napa, Western Auto, O'Reilly. That's a joke, O'Reilly. O'Reilly. <laughs> um, did I miss any parts houses? I, that's what I find. I find those pre-made cables because they're convenient. They were the right length. They had the ends on them already. The problem is, it's not marine grade cable. And what you find is over time, the copper fitting on the end of it, if you were to pull it back a little bit, you're gonna find corrosion in there and that's when those battery cables fail. They use aluminum fittings instead of copper on the end. Um, they're made for automotive use, they're not made for a boat. But again, convenience, that's why they end up in there. It's easier with this little tool that I have, and I've used it a hundred times since I bought it. Peel off the piece of cable I need, put two ends on it, and then you have a spring. Each one of these little slots is labeled for the size. You just slide the cable in there, pinch it down, and then you literally take about a three pound sledgehammer and just knock it. After you've got it crimped, pull it out. Again, a torch, solder, fill it up, heat shrink it, You'll never replace that cable again as long as you have the boat. The next guy might, but you'll have a cable that's good for 15, 20 years. Questions? Anybody? Now's the time. I okay. had one on the amp meter. Did you caution everybody about the checking for amps? No. And the, you know. You don't check amps with this because this meter will only handle milliamps. Correct. That's caution. Don't just hook it up. You will blow your meter. Right. Um, the, the, the amperage meter that comes on these little molded meters will tell you if you read the diagrams. It's only made to measure a certain level of milliamps. And I don't even know what it is because I don't use mine for that. I have an amp meter that I use for starters. And uh, it's, it's one that literally has a little clip on it. And you just slide it right over top of the battery cable and you can hit the starter and it'll actually tell you by magnetic force what the amp draw is on that starter. But um, speaking of starters, let me take a minute to just remind everybody that doesn't know. Marine parts and automotive parts. Yes, there's a major price difference. There's also a major liability difference in some of them. So, fuel pumps, starters, alternators, carburetors. Did I miss anything? Distributors. Distributors. Fuel pump, carburetor, alternator, distributor. Those must be marine grade equipment. Why? Anybody? Spark proof. Alternators will have a screen on the back of them or they will have a screen on the inside of them. Other than that, the alternator looks exactly like the same one that's on your Ford or your Chevy truck out here. But it's, 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 I'm going to say it with air quotes, it's spark proof. Starters, same way. Uh, if you have the GM type starter with the solenoid on top of it, you look close enough, you're going to see that solenoid is sealed around to keep, keep a spark from coming out. The end caps of both, both ends of the starters are also sealed. Um, so that's alternator starter. Fuel pump. Fuel pump is a double drive frame fuel pump. And this is probably, in my opinion, the most crucial part that, about being marine. Uh, you mechanically inclined people, let's go back to the old school days for a second. I got a Chevy pickup truck, 1992 model with a mechanical fuel pump on the front. When it goes bad, when that fuel pump goes bad, what does it do? Anybody? It squirts fuel. There's a little hole drilled on the top of that fuel pump. And when that pump goes bad, it will squirt fuel. But it squirts it out on the ground, right? So if I put that on a motor fuel pump, which will fit on my small block Chevrolet in my boat, and that diaphragm goes bad, where's it going to squirt fuel? In the bilge. In the bilge, which is an enclosed area. You cannot use, and I will tell you, 
if you're caught with one on your boat by law enforcement, there is a hefty fine for all of these parts. Some will inspect, some won't. I'm not going to get into that debate. I'm just going to say, if you're caught, it will cost you. Um, and if you don't, it costs you your life. Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty good way to put it. The marine fuel pump is what's called a double diaphragm pump. It's a little bit larger because it has two diaphragms on it. The second diaphragm won't keep your engine running if the main diaphragm blows. What it does is it keeps the fuel inside the pump. Or in a worst case scenario, you have a clear hose that's supposed to come off of a nipple on that pump, comes up to the carburetor and hooks into either the side of the carburetor or the top of the flame rest. Why does it do that? So that when the fuel pump starts squirting fuel, it comes out that hose and goes back in the engine, not in the engine room. So, if you don't have the clear hose hooked up, hook it up. If you don't have the fittings to hook it up, come see me, I'll show you how to make one. It's not hard, you drill a hole on top of the flame rest, put the fitting in and then run the hose. It's not that big a deal. But it is, you know, like Brian said, it is your life you're talking about here. Um, carburetor must be a marine type carburetor. Biggest difference you're going to find in the carburetors is pretty much one. There's an overflow tube on the front of the carburetor. If the float ever sticks, if a piece of trash ever holds the needle and seat open, on an automotive, fuel just comes out the top of that tube and it just goes everywhere. Not a big deal unless you're in an enclosed engine room because in a truck or a car, it's just going to go down on the ground and it'll evaporate. In your boat, it won't. We've had a problem with, uh, with the uh, ignition switch, and sometimes we'll just lose spark, and the engine will just die, and I can't restart it. We go mess jiggle wires, and the thing starts up again. We've had people come in, like one guy said, I fixed it, but I don't know why, right? which troubles me. But yeah, that's we'll, never a good answer. Right, no, <laughs> so when he was honest, right? he goes, I can't recreate it, so I don't feel good. So we actually have like this kind of backup jumper to go straight from the battery to the coil if I get. But my question is, and the, the question this guy had was that, like, it looks like the wiring goes into like this, this pan, into the black panel. Is there like a... Okay, good, hold on a second. Tell me what the... Commander Commander four, it's a 74 410 Commander. Okay, engines? Uh, it's got the four, four the 427s. 427s? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now tell me where you... Where you ask me what you want to ask me. Well, is I that, can picture the engine. Is that um, on, the, uh, on the starboard engine, we lose, like, it will lose spark. And if it happens, jiggle wire, spark comes back again. Can I just direct wire, or is there like relays in between? Will it will it spin and it just won't start? Is that what you're saying? You're just losing your ignition leg, or does the whole thing go down? The whole thing's done. Okay, so when, when, when it dies, you hit the key, nothing happens. No click, no start, no spin, no nothing. No. Okay. First no. off, <laughs> Breakers or fuses? Probably breakers. On yeah, the breakers. Yeah. Okay, you're gonna have one breaker for each key. Go in and double check the connections on the back of those breakers and make sure they're solid. He solved. absolutely was convinced that one of his 427s became toast two weeks ago because he was out riding 3500. All of a sudden, it was absolutely like somebody just turned the light switch off and the boat just went hard left and here no, we go. That's exactly right. It just exactly. stopped just like dead. The ignition switch. The only problem was, was when his ignition switch went bad, his ignition switch went bad the other way, and it was the one up on the flybridge that went bad. So, what it did was at 3,500 RPMs, it decided, oh, wait, it's time to turn the starter. Oh, it was ugly. <laughs> we just go dead. I mean, it just exploded. Battery starter. That's coming from your battery to the circuit breaker. From the circuit breaker up to the switch, um, and that's what, what we call the main feed for the ignition. Then you've got your ignition wire. The ignition wire comes out of the switch, goes from there. It should just go straight to the coil. You were asking about relays and stuff. Literally, they're, they're, they go into these like these connectors that go into a panel. You've got the aircraft gauges, don't you? The small square gauges. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not good. That doesn't sound good at all. I'm just like, oh, what You've got what are called the. What did, 
did Bob and Jim and all this. Thing. It's aircraft technology. It's it's plastic plugs that connect. Right. It's, it's like a whole patch panel. Of yeah. It's, that's I've dealt with that before, and I'll be honest, I went around it. That, that's what my question is. That, that was one guy said he was. I'm not sure is there a relay in here or can I make can we because we're thinking we should just wire the new wire it down you, the new. You should be able to go straight around. Okay. Yeah. The 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 voltage on those gauges is the same. What that whole gauge package is, is it's printed circuits just like your car is, just like your uh, Bob told me this is basically aircraft technology back then. Uh, it uses really tiny thin spaghetti wire, it uses molded plastic plugs, and I can't say that Bob told me this, but I know somebody told me this, that, that later on in life they, they pretty much decided that stuff just didn't have any place in a boat because of moisture, right. moisture corrosion <laughs> and vibration. Um, I can tell you on a 45, I ripped it all out and put in a whole new instrument panel. And there's a picture of it on my website. Anytime you want to go look at it, it's right there on that notepad you got. Um, just go look in the look in the section that says help makeovers. Um, all I did was I just took all the gauges out, went in with a piece of polished aluminum plate on both sides, and came in with a brand new Stuart Warner gauges all the way down. So, so almost all of that is for the instrumentation. Yeah, because some, because like when the guys are trying to trace the colors, there's a like the, oh, there's multiple tracers on the same wires, and it's because you've got a million of them. Yeah. Have you ever seen that? You've got those, don't you, Mike? You don't have those? No. It's, it's literally, it's like 20 gauge wire. It's thin stuff. But it's all in, mold, in, in molded plugs that plug into these panels. So, yeah, I mean, that's the way I fix it. Questions on any system that I can answer? Yes, sir. Alternators. All oh. of a sudden, my Ford alternator leave the battery on. I was down there playing around and replaced my impellers with you know periodic maintenance. Alternators work. You need to pull it off and get it tested. Are you I see the original system, the external regulator. Yes. Upgrade. If you can find, if you've got a reputable alternator starter shop up here. Yes. Go see him and get a green grade, what they call it, one wire alternator. Mike Murley up in, uh, where is he? Bear Haven. Bear First off, it's internally regulated, so you don't have to worry about finding those little boxes that go on the front of your 427s anymore. They are, those are available. I have found them, sourced them, and I've actually posted it. It's in the super disc. Yeah, but you'll keep buying them. This alternator is internally regulated, and literally, the reason they call it a one wire, it just has one wire to it. It has the positive feet bolted onto it. That's it. It's it's a whole lot better system. It's newer technology and it works great. You'll get a good 14, 14 4 to 14 6 out of it. Who makes it? Uh, basically, in most cases, they use the alternator you already have. It's just an upgrade on internal parts. That's why I said any reputable alternator starter rebuilder shop can do it. I just got a I just got a Presta light back that I'm putting in a Mastercraft now that was converted to one wire. Yeah, I had to replace one of mine. They took the old housing, put the new. They just put the new guts in. Guts it. in it and painted it, and that was it. Unbolt the old the, voltage regulator out the front of the engine and call yep. it a day, eh? Yeah. The less parts you have to trace, the less parts you have to diagnose, the less time you spend fixing. If that one goes, if the one wire goes bad, I can tell you what the symptom is. If the one wire goes bad, it'll overcharge. It'll jump up to 15 to 16 volts. And in that case, it's just like on your car, the diode trio is going bad, which is also the, the voltage regulator. But those things are fantastic. I mean, I at home, I get them converted for 70 to 80 bucks. Hey, Liam, that one yep. wire, aren't, aren't those a they generally, they were before they were converted, yeah. So do we just cut those other three off and spin them together? No. <laughs> no, you can't. Yeah, sure, do that. Let me know how it works. Yeah. 
<laughs> cap them off. And that brings up a good point that I didn't mention. We were talking about crimp connectors. Does anybody in this room have a twist on wire nut in their engine room or their boat anywhere? I did. Everybody know what I'm talking about? They're outlawed on a boat. If it's in there, get it out. Plain and simple. That's all. I just want to make sure nobody has it. Questions? What do you use instead? Crimp connectors with heat shrink and solder. No, I no. You're talking about capping and get wire. Yeah. Uh, you, same thing. Just take crimp connector and cap the wire. Can you keep those wires up, Tracy? Mate, just sure. I, in most cases, what I'll end up doing is, is like on the alternator situation. I'll take the wire and just cut it back a little bit, clip the connector off, and I take the wire and double it back, and then tape and heat shrink. That way, there's no chance of a short. And then I just leave it in the harness. Anybody else? I am here till tomorrow morning. Feel free to use me because once I start turning wrenches on your boat, that's when it costs money. So use me all you want to, and I appreciate y'all coming by, and I hope you learn something. That's it. You have a Rochester Quadrajet carburetor. This is just an example. That overflow tube is either miter cut at an angle or you have a horseshoe tube that comes up and points back in. Either one is acceptable. If it's miter cut, what will happen is if the fuel comes out, the fuel comes out, but it will land back in the throat of the carburetor. That's the object. So either miter cut or a horseshoe tube. If you have Holly carburetors, they already have the horseshoe tubes on both the primary and the secondary. Uh, Edelbrock, which replaced our carters. Edelbrock's already sent. If you if you got a 1409 Edelbrock, which is the same as our Carter uh, AVS, it's already set up. What about the original carters? The original carters. I'll be honest. I've never looked at them close enough to see, but they have to be marine grade to go on the boat. So I, I don't know whether they did it with a horseshoe tube or not. I think it's the cut. Is it the I miter cut? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Either one of those is acceptable by the standard. If it's miter cut, as long as when the fuel comes up, the fuel's going to slide back in. That's that's the object of the game. Okay. Any questions on anything? Now's the time. I have uh, original Pistraff fuel pumps on my 327Qs. And they have the hole. Uh-huh. And they went bad. Uh-huh. And I would get to where I was going to anchor for the day. There was a heavy fuel smell in the cabin of the boat. Uh -huh. I got in the engine room and I inspected everything and it was so hot that it had evaporated so quickly I could not find any dampness or wetness or signs of leakage. Right. And it wasn't until I got back to my dock that I fired the engines up and got in the engine room and they were definitely pumping gas out that little pinhole. Yep. There's no fitting, there's no way to put a fitting on that I can see. Cues are a different bird, but I will tell you, before I tell you, let me go talk with the experts, and the experts are Jim and Bob down at LPX. So this, this was a floating bomb. But, yeah, I, I agree. And the other thing I was going to tell you too is uh, on some fuel pumps, they will not only squirt the fuel out, but they may never squirt the fuel out and still go bad. And what happens is the seal where the pivot arm hits the cam, that seal goes bad and it'll actually pump fuel back into the oil and drop it in the crankcase. And I've seen that happen many times. So you always, whenever you have a fuel pump issue, I always tell people to check the oil on the dipstick too and make sure. If, if there's even a hint of the smell, what I do is take the dipstick and hit a lighter to it. And if it lights, you know there's gas in the oil. I did that. Any other questions on any subject? If we, I can answer it, I will. You talk about the, uh, the wire colors that we've got uh, <laughs> now compared yes. to yes. the wire you're yes. showing yes. us here. That's a good subject, and I'm, I'm going to be polite, and if 
as politically correct as I can about an issue that just it, it irritates me. On the older commanders, 64, 72, maybe later, maybe not. DC wiring and AC wiring on the boats utilize the same colors. Yeah, if you didn't know that, this is a shocker. But let me explain how it works. And I'm going to do it, <coughs> we'll do it with the marker board. The one, th the, the, the one thing I will tell you out of all this is you will never find the DC box and the AC box in the same place. They're generally in two totally different locations of the boat, so that hopefully helps. But I actually worked on a boat up in New York a couple months ago now where the wiring actually got intertwined and it turned ugly. And the reason it turned ugly is because the green wires on that boat's DC side was the bonding wires to bond the rudders, the, the, the rudders, the grounding plates, your through holes. It was green. At the same time, on his shore power, his shore power had been updated to where it used the green wire for the GFCI. The two got together and got intertwined later and it, it created a major issue. So, take notes. If you have a boat in this, in, in this year model, I'm going to make this easy. I'm going to do a DC side. I'm going to do an AC side. Okay. They both use black and white as their primary colors. However, the difference is on the AC side, black is going to be your positive or what electricians would call your load. That's the wire that's going to actually go up into the circuit breaker. That's, that's your carrying load wire is going to be your black. White is going to be your neutral and then green if you have it I'm trying to do this upside down green if you have it is going to be your ground or, or what we call your safety ground if you don't have GFCI outlets yet and you have um, gone to your insurance company for a survey on your 64 to 72 boat Get ready, you're getting ready to buy GFCI breakers because it will become a requirement in your survey. If you don't have them, you will. Um, now, let's move over to the DC side. So everybody's with me on the AC, right? This is your short power. Black is positive, white is neutral, green is ground. So, let's go over to the DC side. You're gonna love this. We have black. We have white. That's all we have on the DC side. Who knows which color is which? Okay, let's let's start. Let's start with 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 a common sense. But I'm going to warn you ahead of time. This is a trick question. <laughs> Forget black and white. Most 12 volt DC wiring is what color? Red and black, right? What is black? Okay. We have black and white. Which color is ground? White. white. It's white. So on your DC side, your white is your negative, your black is your positive. There's, there's no way you could ever get this confused and <laughs> cause a problem, right? There's no way. You it's not possible. Huh? Why it's backwards? Why? Not because they're idiots, because they used to think electricity went from positive to negative. That's why old right. cars have positive ground. Exactly. And and also back then that actually was the code. And keep in mind, we're using household breakers. We're using household fuses on these older boats. This is where I'm gonna, gonna implore to you again about using diagrams, using labels. Don't diagram your boat if you need to. Now, let's talk about the mechanic like me that comes aboard. You want a new radio put on your boat. You want a new VHF or you want a new uh, 
a new VHF or a new AM FM or, or any type of new electronic put on your boat. What's the color coding going to be? Red and black. It's going to be red and black. We're not going to have any problems, are we? I mean, now we're going to have white and black. Then we're going to have red and black. <laughs> we're not going to have any problems, are we? Because your new electronics, your black is going to be ground. But when when Skippy, or as Mr. Moreland calls him, when Bubba comes down and puts in your new radio and he pulls the black down and hooks it up to all the other blacks, what's going to happen? <laughs> He's going to go, I don't know what could have gone wrong. So what's the answer? All right, here's the answer. This is my opinion. This is not a, you absolutely have to, this is my opinion. Do your absolute best to keep your wire color and code one or the other. It's obviously easier to keep it to the old code because you've got more wires that are already the old, old code. How do you do this? Simple. Every parts house has color tape. You can get the color tape in green, you can get the color tape in white, you can get the color tape in black, you can get the color tape even in red. So, if you're pulling a new radio or you're pulling a new light or you're pulling anything new that you're going down to your junction boxes, just simply use a roll of black tape and a roll of white tape. You don't have to rewire the whole wiring harness. Just rewire enough where you make the connection so that you know what it is. Then take your zebra printer or take your Sharpie, whatever you want to, label it. You know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing when I open up an electrical cabinet and I'm looking for a GPS wire and I just have a tag staring at me that says GPS positive. It takes the hard work out, makes it easy. When it makes my job easy, it makes your bill cheaper. That's just a clue. <laughs> if I spend four hours trying to find a wire, you're going to pay for four hours. If I spend four minutes trying to find a wire, you're going to pay for four minutes. Any questions? Okay. So, there's your DC. There's your AC. We've talked about the easiest solution. Any questions?